of the 2018 Disruptive Innovation Festival. Aww. But don't worry, because we've got an action-packed hour for you right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. It's the last show on the last day of the 2018 Disruptive Innovation Festival, the fifth Disruptive Innovation Festival we've ever held. And we worked out actually in year one that Disruptive Innovation Festival is quite a mouthful. So that's why we shortened it to a snappy little acronym, DIFF, because no one's going to mispronounce that, right? Um, so that's all we have time for today. Check out the DIFF schedule. Good evening. There's one more session left in today's uh, dish rundown. Um, but there is one more question on the uh, think, do think Diff. Hi everyone, welcome to the Dingle. Um, another great. Hello and welcome to the Quiff. Welcome to the Duff. Hello and welcome to the Thingy Fungus. My name's Emily. Hi, welcome to the Diplodocus. We've got a great. Se well, it seems that not everyone can get it right all the time. But we're lucky because tonight we're joined with um, eight different guests who can all pronounce diff correctly most of the time. And they're going to talk us through what's been going on at the 2018 Disruptive Innovation Festival. The first two guests that we have on the sofa is Emily Skagel and Kinga Guardian. And I only recently worked out how to properly pronounce your name, Kinga, and then I just <laughs> mispronounced it just now <laughs> after a joke about wrongly pronouncing things. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kinga, your role at the DIFF this year informally is DIFF Queen, but what does that mean more formally? <laughs> that I oversee what, what's happening and when something goes wrong, I'm there and hopefully nothing goes wrong. Really? Well, we'll it, find out in the next yeah. time <laughs> if it's all going to suddenly go wrong. Emily, tell us, what's your role at the DEF? What, how, what role do you play in the team here? So I'm the communications coordinator, so that branches across social media and news items, newsletters, blogging, Facebook Lives, all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, really wide span, but basically communicating with our audience. Kinga, tell us, we are here in the live studio right now, but the live studio is one of a handful of formats that we've got for the DEF. Can you explain to the audience what else, how else we broadcast? Yeah, so we had uh, five main formats this year. The studio was one of them, um, where we are right now. But we also had DIFF on Airs, which is where contributors from all around the globe join us and talk about their ideas and innovations um, via, via Google Hangouts. So they join, join from wherever they are and, and, um, and join the conversation. It's so one of them. Then we also have the DIFF Films. We, um, we've created three our, ourselves as well, but also loads of films from our contributors. And then we have the podcasts, and a relatively new format that we had this year. Um, and, and I think it's a really nice, one, different way of, of, of viewing, of listening to content. And our fifth one this year is the learner journey, where people um, can learn all about the circular economy. Uh, and it's, of course, it's not just us who makes all of the content. We've got this thing called Diff Collaborators, and Emily, I know you're involved in all of that. What's all that about? Yeah, so collaborators have always been a really important part of the Diff, but I think they've really excelled themselves this year. So we've had 10 different collaborators, and their role essentially is to diffuse our content through their networks. But I think they've really gone above and beyond this year. So a couple of examples is Circular Economy Club have held viewing parties across the globe in I think around 50 different cities, which is great. So they're getting like-minded people together with uh, the same ideas and innovations to talk around, to talk about their, the session that they're watching. Um, and another collaborator that I'd like to highlight is Collabor America. Um, we live streamed actually from their festival this year. It's a festival of new economies in Latin America. And Latin America has been a really interesting audience for us. Um, so it's really great to take over their main stage um, and get involved with them. So that's been really fun. Okay, and when it comes to the content of the DIFF, we, we um, categorise it into three broad themes, and we picked our themes earlier this year for the DIFF. And throughout this highlight show, of course, we're going to look at uh, three, three of those three themes, and we're going to look at a few of the shows that fit within that theme. We've chosen to speak about right now materials and design, and of course, you've got a background as a designer, Kinga. Um, why, why did we make materials and design one of our themes? Why does that matter to the DIFF? Well, we've had a look first to... Um 
we did a big brainstorm and came up with loads and loads of different topics. And we've chosen materials and design because we noticed that there is a growing question for designers about materials, also a bigger uh, target group, I guess, but really specific about materials and what, what can we do and how do we know what materials to use. So it was a lot of questions we had around materials and design. So better way to find out than the diff. And I think we're going to show a clip right now of one of our favourites. This is um, Zoe Lachlan. Well, I'll let her explain what's going on here in this clip. Slowly will be revealed. Actually, it does look do it like, like this. Are you sure they're in there? There's, Someone... well, at the moment it's ah. bubbles, but suddenly it's full of sort of marbles. Now, we just call these invisible balls, but this is, this is the same stuff Ooh. contact lenses are made out it of. It feels like a giant... It's like a jelly like an gummy bear or something, or an eyeball. Ooh, it's I like nice. it. I like it's sort that. of bouncy. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on cue, the, um, these, these are, they have this wondrous optical property, but that's sort of it. The only other use I've come across um, for them is florists use them in flower arranging to have a, a vase of water with a load of these in and then oh. stems standing. But, they look like they just stood there, but yet they're held up by these invisible balls. These... They're, they're lovely things, and they're sort of delightful, utterly delightful. And if I don't know if we've got a good shot, let's wait. Is the camera? Can the camera see this? Right, I'm going to pour the water in, and you'll see them go invisible again. That's cool. So yeah. Wow, just like magic. Um, that show is called Materials and Making in the Doff Studio. And <laughs> Emily, I'm glad that was one of your favourite sessions this year. Yeah, Zoe's session was great. She brought so much energy to the studio and it was really cool to be able to play with materials kind of live on air. Um, I know that some of the Diff team were playing around with those invisible balls afterwards as well, throwing them all over the Diff office. But um, yeah, she brought so much energy. It was really interesting to hear how you can just make materials that we see around us every day, kind of yourself. It was a mo moment where it's like, don't do this at home, but we really want to. Um, and actually, during the session, she made this is one of her pieces that she made. Um, that's all that then. What is this? So, this is a piece of transparent concrete. Um, and what's really quite cool about it is that we can see light travelling through it. So, you can see that on the diff camera. Mm. Yeah, so we had, um, I think Kinga was one of the people that helped mix this up live on air. So, we had about four or five of the diff team and they were mixing concrete, and this was the final result, which is great. What's, uh, what's the purpose of having light being able to travel through concrete? I just think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, but um, yeah, what is the purpose, Kinga? I, th I think it was something around showing that um, we can do way more with, with material that we know than, than we thought. Well, I, I understood the purpose was in a, in a darker um, part of an office yeah. or in a building, you can transport the light from outside uh, into without having to spend money. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that, so that was Zoe Lachlan, Materials and Making in the Diff Studio. Um, we're going to watch another clip just now. This features a chemist. His name is Patrick Maestro. He works for an organisation called Solvay, and he's going to tell us about how a, a large... Well, in fact, I'm not going to... Spoiler, I'm going to let Patrick tell us what he's going to say. Chemistry uh, learns a lot from nature and, and will learn a lot. The problem is not to completely mimic the nature, but is to get inspired. And for example, uh, by, uh, photosynthesis is something that uh, will, uh, is inspiring chemistry in terms of how to reproduce it. But the problem for photosynthesis is very slow, so we need to try to find chemical processes that can be accelerated by uh, some energy at the time. It's nothing easy. There is no free lunch. <laughs> but uh, we are really looking at uh, these kind of things. We are looking at uh, uh, the, 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 some of the uh, specificities that nature gives to plants, to animals, to understand how it works. For example, the so-called lotus leaf, the super hydrophobicity that you get on some leaves. And we try to reproduce that by either bio-based chemicals or traditional chemicals and physics, because in the end you realize that not only it's the chemical composition, but also the nature of the surface that brings the property. So uh, we can work on surface modification, we can work on mechanical properties. You need that some shells have very, very strong uh, mechanical properties. So we understand, we try to understand what is the structure to be able to reproduce these kind of things 
by the, the, the chemical, the chemistry. So we are more and more going into what's so-called bio-inspired materials. So that show was called Holding It All Together. It featured Patrick Maestro, great surname. Kinga, you were really excited by that session and what you had to say in that clip in particular. What was it that got you so excited? Um, I think it's, I didn't know that much about chemistry. Um, and it is that we, we used a random product selector. We featured it in the lounge as well, but it shows a product. And Patrick was able to tell us a bit more about what the chemistry is behind that product. And um, it's, it's interesting to, to hear about it and really hear how many chemistry there is in the products that we use. And the fact that he's from a major chemicals company reflecting on this idea of uh, taking inspiration from nature, which I, I guess we've always seen as a kind of outside, outside the box kind of idea. Um, but here we have a large company now talking seriously about it and what we can learn from it. I took away from that um, great excitement that this is being looked at seriously. But we want to talk about a couple of quick other things um, in the theme of materials and design. Uh, we have a ecosystem design featured Chris Grantham and Colin Webster. Um, and you wanted to say something about ecosystem design. What, what was Chris going on about? Um, it was really interesting. We hear, we hear about ecosystem design, system design um, quite a lot. And he was telling about what they do at IDEO to really implement uh, um, circular products, circular services, and they use, um, they call it their collabs, where they collaborate with a lot of different partners, and, and that he told us more about that and, and how they use their ecosystem design to, to really implement these, these kind of products. And very quickly, let's have a look at one other session we just picked out. Uh, Steve Parkinson from Autodesk was in this one. This was like day two of the diff talked about um, how uh, through new technologies we can, and particularly 3D printing, we can play around with the structure and the way that we, in which we uh, can, can create designs like this. Quite skeletal looking. So it's just like design A and as it goes through the different processes, you can work out what materials to strip out. And Steve thinks that this is gonna be, whoops. That would have been a disaster for Jenga. That, this is gonna be the future of how our products are gonna look. Well, I gave away the game for what we're going to do next. I have designed a Jenga game for us to play in the live studio. Thank you. Thank you. It's took me quite a lot of today's work to put this together. <laughs> now, the rules are quite simple. I'd like you to pick a Jenga block each, and you will find a question on the block. Give us an answer to it. Oh God, on you go, Emily. Okay. Not the green one. Oh, really? Not the green one? There is no question in the green one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so well prepared. That's fine. I'm this one. Okay, my question is, what's something you've always wanted to know but have never asked? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, what's something, okay, what have I always wanted to know? I've always wanted to know, um, Kinga, I've actually never asked this to you. I'm gonna put you on the spot oh, here. <laughs> And it's, on the, it's, on the theory, it's, on the, it's on the theme of materials and making and okay. design. Um, how did you get into design and, how, and why do you enjoy it so much? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> why do I enjoy it so much? I, I just, yeah, problem solving, yeah. creative, creating new solutions. And the problems that we often solve are not the easiest ones. And I like to kind of tackle the... Yeah, that's nice, a great nice answer. Nice answer. Kenya, <laughs> well, you grab one quickly. <laughs> The purple one. Yeah. Would you rather be itchy for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> or sticky for the rest of your life? Oh, Sounds familiar, yeah. that question, yeah. <laughs> I did have three weeks to think about this one. What's your answer? Itchy or sticky for the rest of your life? I guess itchy. Itchy's better, is it? Why, Ooh, is, that, why is that better? Because that bothers me. But then you get, I don't know, you'd be flick, your skin would be in a bad yeah. shape. But sticky. Sticky's not, not so good. Much better. Mm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kinga and Emily. In just a second, we're going to have a couple of new guests, and we're building up to having Ellen MacArthur uh, on the sofa. She's going to be reflect reflecting on what's been going on at the diff and what she's been enjoying. But just before we switch over and say goodbye to Emily and Kinga, we're going to have a look at one of the diff films that we produced for this year featuring a chap called Hamilton Enrique. This is a truly wonderful film. It's 11 minutes long and he tells a fantastic story about a social business based in Brazil.
Problemas relacionados à péssima dados alimentares na comunidade é a coisa mais comum possível. Então a ideia que a gente tinha era de levar alimentação saudável para a comunidade. Mas da onde vem um produto? Eu não estava atento para isso, eu preciso do produto ali. Então a gente começou a incentivar que tivesse a agricultura dentro da comunidade para ficar mais perto, para que a gente comprasse e que a comunidade também fosse privilegiada em ter acesso àquela alimentação. E aí eu vi uma oportunidade de negócio. O desenho estava perfeito. E agora vamos vender. O Saladorama é um negócio social. E ser um negócio social é pensar no desenvolvimento da comunidade em, em todas as esferas e também ganhar dinheiro com isso. Um dos maiores desafios é criar um modelo de negócio sustentável dentro de uma periferia com uma proposta tão desafiadora que é mudar uma cultura de alimentação. Desse modelo que começou a fazer muito sentido, a gente começou a replicar para outras comunidades. O funcionamento da economia local nas periferias traz primeiro um resultado gigante, que é a empregabilidade. Mas quando esse dinheiro ele faz o giro dentro da própria comunidade, os serviços dentro da comunidade melhoram, as pessoas têm mais qualidade de vida. Então eu acredito que essa evolução de negócio social ela vai passar a ser negócios de impacto social. É, vão ser empresas de impacto social. São empresas que se preocupam não só com a venda do seu produto, mas o, qual é o ciclo que esse dinheiro faz e qual é o impacto que a empresa em si causa na sociedade. Meu nome é Hamilton Henrique, tenho 30 anos, morador de Recife e sou fundador do Saladorama. So that's Hamilton Enrique, I think it's called the story of food revolution. Uh, right, joining us now on the sofa, it's Seb and Miranda. <laughs> Seb and Miranda, you've both been in this live studio uh, many times in the diff and Seb, you've probably been a lot of on airs as well. People will be wondering though, what when you're not on camera, Seb, what is it you do at the diff? <laughs> um, when I say people, I mean, actually the people in this <laughs> room are wondering. <laughs> Um, so actually, I, I was part of the first diff as an intern, um, and so I got to do a bit of everything. But now, uh, predominantly, I work on our marketing strategy. I write a lot of our social media content, and also work across our uh, with our contributors who apply to be a part of the diff to help their sessions come to life. And Miranda, you have been in the live studio a couple of times already. Both times you've been talking about cities. Why do you talk about cities when you're in here? <laughs> Every day. Um, so uh, I'm part of the institutions, governments, and cities team here at the foundation. So we manage the relationships that we have with those cities. We're constantly exploring new relationships, also governments and institutions. And this year specifically, we've been working on a piece of research about the potential of circular economy in cities and what that can mean. And right now, we're going to talk about cities and food almost as if it was planned. Wow! <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Um, so Miranda, talking of cities, I remember many months ago you shared internally this, this idea of the super blocks in Barcelona and that's become something that we've looked at in, in greater detail. Can you tell us what are the super blocks? Why are you excited about super blocks? No, what are they? That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> okay, what they are um, is they basically there are too many cities are facing the problem of too many cars in their cities. Um, and, but lots of cities are already built. They don't have the luxury of redesigning or starting from scratch. But what I love about the idea of superblocks is they've used the system that they have in place. So they've looked at their city, they've realized they've got this grid system around which many of the, many of the houses are built, and they've carved them into blocks of nine, so three by three. Um, and then in the, in the roads that are in the inside of that grid, they've limited or almost basically cut out traffic, um, which leads to obviously a reduction in the number of cars being used, but all sorts of other benefits around what you can do with that space now that it's no longer filled with vehicles. Okay, and we managed to film the, 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 ar the architect behind the idea of Superblocks in Barcelona when we saw him earlier this summer. His name is Salvador Rueda. We're gonna play a short clip of him explaining what some of the benefits are of the Superblocks. And people, eating in the fiesta, uh, making a sport, uh, uh, playing the children. Uh, we have more than 50 activities, different activities developed inside of the new super block. Because the flexibility of the public space is different. 
the interchange, the market, the leisure, all kind of leisure, the culture, the art, the code, the knowledge inside of the public realm, even the expression, manifestation, and democratic aspects. in our feature length documentary System Reset you can watch that session and of course everything else all 145 sessions or whatever the number is uh, at the diff this year at thinkdiff.co and the content will be available for some time to come yet so make sure you uh, go and browse through the whole catalogue Miranda so that was one uh, one uh, show you've picked out there but there's been a handful of sessions about cities at the diff mm. what's been a highlight for you? Um so, I mean, I really loved how cities have come up multiple times because also all the materials that King was just talking about, they flow through cities and so on. But I really like this session actually with um, Robbie and Kat from Us Creates. Um, they were talking about the Bloomberg's Mayor Challenge, Mayor's Challenge and they had lots of examples of um, pilots that were being developed in cities and how they'd really, test, really, really tested things and totally changed their ideas about what would actually make the city better on the back of having spoken to citizens. And there's a little moment in there where they, where they say, um, actually, it's about the vulnerability of, of uh, policymakers going out early with ideas. They're obviously coming from a good place, but they might not really be the real answer or solution to the things that citizens need or businesses need. So that vulnerability of going out there early and then sort of exposing yourself to someone saying, actually, no, that's not the solution, but we think it might be something like this. And then they iterate, and then they get to a better place. So. It was not one specific example, but the, the sort of slight shift in how you develop policies and cities um, uh, to that sort of capturing that vulnerability point. I really like that. Super. Uh, Seb, you're going to talk to us about food and some of the sessions about food this year. <laughs> well, Colin, if you're interested in food, you won't have gone hungry during this year's diff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> we had a lot Cut. of... Yeah. <laughs> we had a load of really great um, sessions around food. Um, obviously, it's a really pressing topic. How are we going to feed 9 billion people in 2050? And that ranges from how do we design our food systems? How do we produce it? What kinds of innovations can we create? Or where do we produce our food? Linking really strongly came up in a number of the city sessions as well. Um, but we had a session uh, that focused on China. What, what's the future of food in China in terms of the you know, fifth of the world's population living in this country? And what are entrepreneurs doing? to innovate um, in that system. We had a session on uh, will the world really run out of food, which featured our own food, circular economy, the food and cities team. Um, but the one I really want to uh, focus on is we had uh, a celebrity chef, uh, a celebrity chef, I don't know if he's a celebrity, but he's a celebrity yes, yeah. in my eyes now, <laughs> and he's been on the diff, um, who uh, he, he started this, this restaurant in London, which is uh, basically focused on locally sourced and ingredients. It's focused on seasonal farming and uh, follows something called the Chef's Manifesto around the future of food. His name was Justin and he did a demonstration in our kitchen, uh, which hopefully we're going to tease up now. Going through on your conversation about local and uh, celebration of local and uh, seasonal ingredients, we've been making our, our gnocchi um, dough, which comes from uh, locally Isle of Wight um, grown um, pumpkins we have. Um, and yeah, so it's been fascinating what uh, um, you guys have been talking about and how the, the Chef's Manifesto, as well as the uh, SRA, are sort of working towards very similar goals. The 10, the ten points that the SRA have and the, the eight, point, uh, eight um, uh, thematic areas that the, the Manifesto, which I have a copy of here, um, works through. And uh, I've actually designed this uh, three-course meal um, covering uh, quite a lot of the different points we have in the Manifesto. Um, I actually... Uh gave him the idea for that recipe. But I think what's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just great to do something different um, during the diff and that session um, also included a couple of other people who are really invested in that topic. Um, so and it was hosted by very Nick Jeffries in the studio. So it's definitely a session very to relaxed cast up. host. He was <laughs> Nick, yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> so food was a big theme, or it wasn't actually a theme in the diff, but it was a, a recurring topic in the diff this year. And the diff this year has been uh, a huge success for us. We've been really delighted with 
the number of people we've been viewing and the feedback that we've been getting and the quality of production. And it leads me to think if by year five in the diff we're so pleased with how things are going, I mean, how, what do you think about what's the future of the diff for you, Seb? Well. Not now, God's sake. And then I realised it was in my pocket all along. Classic <laughs> <laughs> Seb. Nice man, nice man. Oh, oh, look, we've got our 10 millionth diff oh. you. Oh. Yes, Seb. Yes, Seb. Seb, 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 we lost, we lost you for a minute there. What does the future hold for the deaf, I said? Oh, it's very hard to think, very hard to predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we say goodbye to you two, I'd like you to pick a Jenga block. I'm only going to ask you to do it this time, Seb, thank you. Miranda's I'm shaking, actually, I'm shaking actually really quite terrible about this because I've, I've never won Shouldn't you go disruptive and just... Purple. 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 There, there are no Choose purple carefully. ones to take. <laughs> <laughs> I'm colour blind. <laughs> A rising tide lifts all boats. What does that mean? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really good. <laughs> what does that <laughs> mean? Should take a purple one. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is this expression about the global economy, the idea that uh, growth is good for us all. If the economy grows, everyone benefits. But of course, we've spent the last three weeks, and especially um, Ken Webster and, and, and sitting in this chair in the launch party, questioning um, that theory and whether that is the only measure of success that we should be valuing. Mm. And talking of Ken Webster, we're going to say goodbye to Seb and to Miranda right now and we're going to play a little clip from Ken Webster. And Ken is um, perhaps the person who had the, the original idea behind the Disruptive Innovation Festival and I think this has been the realisation of this, this dream he had five or six years ago. So thanks to very much to Ken for putting the original thoughts together for this. But he's going to tell us here what he told us on the first night of the diff. And it strikes me that a lot of what you're saying there is the word agency comes yeah. up for me. And I feel like um, sometimes it feels that the economy is something that happens to you, that it's, well, we, we don't really know. Isn't that ridiculous in a way? It's like, is it a force of nature? It just happens to us? It's, it, but but I, I, I it mean, feels a bit like this mystical thing that, that, that occurs that we don't have, perhaps have much agency over. So the title of this, this diff topic of people in the economy, yeah. that would suggest that there is agency and, and that people can, can do something to, to change the course of the economy. Well, we talk a lot about technology in this, um, in, the, in the diff, and people talk about technology a lot. Uh, but it's to whose ends is it, is it applied? Can we get agency? Can we really use it to produce and consume more directly, that's one of the themes that, uh, that come up quite often. Uh, is it about redefining what the economy should be doing, how it should work? Because I think one of the big problems is that we've forgotten that we created the economy. You know, the economy is for us, it, you know, we're not to fit it. It isn't a force of nature, it's the decisions that have been built up over decades. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working for a lot of people now, it really needs reworking to fit a different framework, a different worldview. And that worldview is not set, it's, it's emerging in discussions such as the work doing, uh, done in the DIFF and, uh, and many other fora. Apologies to anyone who was too distracted by Joe's trousers to understand what Ken Webster was saying there, but he, the good news is he has promised never to wear those trousers <laughs> in the DIFF studio again. <laughs> Okay, joining me now on the sofa is uh, two new guests. It's Lara and Bledar. <laughs> Lara and Bledar, you are our intern. Every year we seem to find fantastic interns to come and work for us at the DIFF. Seb included, actually. Um, and here we've got two great interns this year. Um, and you've really been an integral part of what's been a hugely successful DIFF for us this year. Tell us, what's the experience been like? Lara, I'll start with you. Okay, well, I think that when they asked me before the diff what I was looking for were the most, I said the, the snack box, but actually <laughs> it's, been, it's been obviously about much more than that. And it's been a great opportunity to learn about topics that I think that otherwise I would have never read about. 
So I, I came across blockchain in Africa, the gig economy, uh, I, I, businesses in like Chile and in other parts of the world, and they really, they really inspired me to, to read and learn more about things that can promote a circular economy transition, but basically about a lot of innovations going on around the world. I don't know if, if that's the same for you, Blether. I think it would be vice versa for me. I was looking for the dialogues with these diverse people with the diverse insights, with a geographical reach that is so wide, but I ended up visiting the snack box way too often. <laughs> uh, but it was so true. It was more or less the opposite, right? Pretty much the opposite. <laughs> uh, but it was an enriching experience. I think the, the discussions that have to be held are reaching the diff much more than they've done in any kind of other platform. So we've really enjoyed it. And I have to agree, I love the diversity of topics that we have and, and what you have to put yourself through in order to to get up to speed so you can interview the guests that you have. And talking of that, what's, what is that experience like um, when you are a host of a session? Because between you, you've hosted more than a dozen sessions this year. And the people online just see what happens in the 40 minutes or whatever. But a lot more work goes into that process. Blader, kick it off. What's, what do you go through? It is a long process. Uh, it's a much longer process than the, the diff itself. So you prepare with all the contributions first. You get to read through them. You have to know what they're about. You talk to the guys behind the contributions. And you have these test calls where you tech, uh, test everything. And you have to talk to these people about what they're talking about and just kind of align the, the thoughts of us as hosts and them as speakers. So th there's this three, four month period that we've been working on this. Uh, until the diff comes, and then you know how that is. Mm, yes, and also you have to think about the audience that is looking at the session. So you can, you know, you have to keep a balance between being maybe too technical, but also you know covering the the topic in a little bit in depth. So so I think that that it's it's really interesting how you have to have in mind very different people and as well how we had to practice with each other in the beginning because we are not journalists so this was all this was new to us so it was a really great experience and now we're going to watch a clip of a show that you hosted Laura this is about the gig economy let's have a quick look at that okay. what kind of barriers are people experiencing when they try to access these platforms so not to replace them, but normally when you want to enter labor market, you need a diploma. Um, and with platforms, most platforms, there is no diploma required. So you just you start working at a platform and then people rate your, uh, uh, your jobs. And that is more important than, than your diploma. There are research to say in gig economy, it's more important to have a good reputation than to have a good diploma. Uh, so it's really easy for people to start. So all the biases you normally have when you want to start working in an organization, they are not there with the gig economy. Uh, some, of course, you have barriers from a more legal perspective, like a taxi license, but that's more a, a, a legal question. The points Martin makes uh, in that film is that, yeah, the rating that people get in the gig economy as a driver or whatever it happens to be can really shape um, your career in that sort of, maybe it's not a career that people have in the gig economy, of course, temporary a job, I guess we might just call it. Uh, Bledar, you, um, we're going to show a clip of a show that you hosted uh, with a, an extravagant fella. Who's this we're going to see? Uh, you're going to see Kyle Veens, the CEO of iFixit. Is that how you pronounce it? I think Kyle the, the jury is out. I did ask. You asked him and he said <laughs> yes, Veens? And we are sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't believe you, but uh, <laughs> let's watch Kyle Veens right yes. now. Well, yeah, manufacturing is a system, um, but it's a it's a and and we've invested a lot of research in figuring it out. Uh, I uh, my company we design and sell, so we manufacture and sell toolkits. This is our, our screwdriver set. So I'm very familiar with all the the complicated challenges of setting up manufacturing. Repair is also a system and has has just as many challenges. Uh, if you if you think about, I mean, it, it's distributed. Uh, you have to get make sure that that parts are available in a distributed fashion. Uh, a lot of you know manufacturing of spare parts you want to do at the same time you're manufacturing a product, and maybe you shut down that assembly line. You have to project out and know how many parts are we going to uh, are we going to be warehousing for the next ten years, and and that's a that's a challenging problem to figure out and 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 do that forecasting. But it's worth it because the profit margins are going to be there in the parts. So that's uh, clips from two shows that fall under the theme, People in the Economy. 
Um, and there's been, well, of course, many, many dozens of shows that feature on that idea of people in the economy. We've got a couple of images we'll put up just now. One's from the Startup Day that we ran on Wednesday. Uh, Bledar, a few words about what the Startup Day was and what the ultimate prize was. So the Startup Day was a day where we uh, showcased a lot of innovations from diverse uh, startups all over the world with, with different industries really transcending any kind of sector. And uh, the winner, Nairobi here, uh, did win a membership at the Emerging Innovators Program, at the CE100 program at the Alan MacArthur Foundation. And that is a heck of a prize, right? Because it is what do they get in the CE100? So they get a lot of things, but among those that are most important is they get uh, these, this, this network that is so, so large and so great where they can discuss these ideas that they have with a much larger group than they thought about from the beginning and they receive these digital tools where they can uh, be even better in the future and just go move forward. Okay, and uh, the next one we'll just reflect on very quickly features this lady, Radhika Bainan, who in this uh, show, the Diff Magazine shop, was just today. Uh, she managed to get a shot of her bin in the background. It was a class, Diff classic. <laughs> Amongst other things, she talks about universal basic income and the benefit that this can bring. And of course, we had a show about universal basic income as well, didn't we? Where, they, where um, Peter McCall and Amal Zelek talked about what this could really bring, how it could free people um, from, from, from uh, having to work long hours in jobs perhaps they don't fully appreciate and free them to do creative things and to look after their kids and to... Yeah, all, all sorts of different activities. So that fits nicely into the idea of people in the economy. Okay, it's time to say goodbye to Laura and Bledar from the sofa. And um, before, in just a minute, we're going to introduce two new guests, Joe Isles. <laughs> and Ellen MacArthur. <laughs> but before we see them, we're going to have a little clip uh, from another one of our colleagues, it's Mats Linders who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, this initiative, the new plastics economy. One, one interesting flavour to add though is that, yes, it is, it is a long journey uh, and it's, it's not by, any, by far over yet. Um, we like to th think of these 250 plus com companies and organisations as a start, not an end point. But it is, has been a very exponential journey Still, if, if just to give some some context, I think uh, in 2017, in January, Unilever became the first company to publicly go out and say, you know, by 2025, 100% of our packaging uh, is going to be either reusable, recyclable, or compostable. Uh, at the Our Ocean Conference 2017, so that's roughly a year uh, or 13 months um, ago, uh, Unilever had. Uh, uh, been joined by five other companies. So there were six companies with basically the same commitment. And we were excited. And we were excited. Yeah. And one year later at the, um, uh, at the Arosian Conference, we are with the global commitment now. So, so it's a truly exponential journey that we, of course, uh, well, we know it needs to continue to be exponential, mm -hmm. uh, given that we're starting from a, from a pretty challenging uh, position. And changing the global material flows of plastic is not happening overnight. Okay, so that was uh, Dr. Mats Linder. But joining us now in the studio, it's Joe and Ellen. <laughs> um, there we had Mats was telling us about this um, momentum that's growing around a whole bunch of companies worldwide, not just companies, but other institutions as well, um, around this idea of um, a, a global commitment that's been in the news recently. I think three weeks ago in Bali, something happened. Can you tell folks at home what that was all about, Ellen? Well, the global commitment wasn't just what happened in Bali when we launched it, but it was actually the result of nearly four years' work beforehand mm. to look at you know, one global material flow, which is plastic packaging, seven to eight million tonnes a year. And we started to look at the numbers and we started to look at the leakage and we realised that actually 32% of seven to eight million tonnes leaks out into the environment and actually only 2% is recycled into the same quality material. So we began a process with companies, with cities, with regions, looking at the scale of the problem first, then looking at what the solution could look like, which we believed was redesigning part of it, um, making some of it completely recyclable, 
and the other reusable, which was 50% re designed to be recycled, 20% reusable, and 30% really redesigned. And then the next part of that process was trying to create a global commitment to physically shift that, to kind of generally agree what we're trying to do and then actually move it. And that's what we launched in Bali, and we now have over 20% of all plastic packaging production globally by weight signed up to the global commitment, and we're really just a few weeks in. So it's been absolutely phenomenal and really focused on the beginning of the pipe, you know, when you talk about plastics leakage, there's a lot of talk about getting it out of the ocean and beach cleanups, but the new plastics economy and the work around the global commitment is going right to the beginning of the system and changing it, changing it so that it can actually work in the long term. And uh, Matt and Sarah, who was in that show, were telling me the phone is kind of ringing hot with other organisations mm -hmm. who want to be part of this global commitment too, so it's had a really big impact. It's had a big impact, and I think, you know, where the, the energy around it is, and there, there is that real feeling of energy, is that it's so solutions orientated, it seems like an impossible pro problem, you know, to, to shift the total global plastic flows, but it can only be done if we collaborate like we've never seen before in history, really, around one material globally. And the fact that people are willing to collaborate, some of the biggest companies in the world are already signed up, that's really creating momentum and energy. It's really cool. Talking about having a huge impact, Joe, you've got your trousers on again I today. I want to say, for a start, Colin, um, <laughs> I want to give a shout out to Tim Elliott uh, on Twitter, who actually, I found him, he actually liked these. Um, so thanks, Tim. At least someone's got some taste. I think they go well with the confetti. I, I think that's. Say, I At least someone's yeah. making an effort. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Look, thanks, Joe. Just blending in. I'm on brand. <laughs> That's true. Joe, um, of course, you're, you're a famous face to people who have seen you at the DEF because you, you quite often are hosting in the studio. You, la you were at the, the launch party as well. You were the host there. What, uh, what else do you do in and around the DEF? And you've been with us, what, five year, all five years of this too. Yeah, I don't know what I did wrong at the launch because I was in that seat. And now <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, I, yeah, I, was, I mean, I was uh, lucky enough to be Kind of working with Ken and, and yourself and Seb and um, Becky a few years ago when we, we kind of set up the first diff, uh, which was kind of a crazy idea at the time, born from a kind of bit of a dissatisfaction with the way that people, the online learning um, kind of experiences that people had. We wanted ours to be kind of different, a bit richer and a bit more like the diff that people have been part of this year. Um, the rest of the time I work on um, editorial work at the, at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and particularly focused on um, kind of language and, and messaging. So we know that circular economy is um, more and more people are talking about it and there's tends to be, um, which is great, but there tends to be a lot of confusion about um, what circular economy is and isn't. So what we're trying to do is really make it kind of as, as simple and as, an, as accessible as possible um, so people can can kind of relate to it as a concept and see why it would be beneficial for the future. And the diff is part of that as well. We, we, it's amazing to see so many people engaging with the concept of circular economy during the diff, taking part in the learner journey. And circular economy comes up in so many of the sessions and it's all useful feedback to see how people take these ideas on board and how they're kind of playing with them and experimenting with them and seeing how they connect with other ideas as well. Why do why does the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who you know, we produce these reports with global management consultants and so on, why, why would you get involved in confetti and trousers like this and a, a setup like the well, death? That's maybe you a probably don't want to be uh, <laughs> involved no, with these. I think I think Joe's point. You know, when we when we created the diff five years ago, it, it was quite frankly an experiment. We wanted to try something different. We wanted to put content online and and kind of throw it in the air and, and see where it fell. And I think that's that's still more than ever the spirit of the diff. There's so much content out there that somehow connects together, perhaps not initially in your mind, but when you start to understand a circular economy and disruptive innovation and the shift that needs to happen globally in our economy so it can shift from you know, that linear take, make, dispose to something which is restorative and regenerative and all about innovation and creativity. It's, mm. a, it's a massive opportunity and, and that's what we're trying to reflect, exactly that opportunity in the diff, to get the information out there and, as Joe said, to get feedback, you know, to hear how people process information and how they link things together. We learn all the time and that's what this is all about. But how do, what's, what's it got to do with the circular economy? Because not every session we run is circular economy or the people who speak in them don't even know what the idea is. So what, what's the importance of well, us running sessions that aren't circular economy focused? Well, I think, you know, when you look at the circular economy, it's, it's the systems change. You know, our current economy, as I said, is linear. We take a material out the ground, we make something out of it and we throw it away. Not because we really intended to, but because it's a result of the Industrial Revolution. The circular economy is looking at the economy in an entirely different way. It's shifting that line 
into a circle through being uh, designing waste out sorry waste and pollution out through keeping products and materials in use and through regenerating natural systems now that is the entire economy shifting from a line to a circle there's so many elements needed to make that happen many that we don't even know of you know listening to the blockchain conversation i find absolutely fascinating because you find this this ability to connect and and label and understand and you know i in my own mind until that session hadn't really begun to completely process how blockchain could become a part of the circular economy and by the end of it i had so I find you know, that, that, that connecting of the dots for me is exactly, hopefully, what's happening outside and, and you know, even among our team. You're referring to blockchain, the forgotten ones, I believe. Yeah, I think yes. that was the one that you watched. And we've got a little clip, so I actually haven't seen this show, so I'm going to look forward to this wee clip just now. Uh, most of the world is the working poor. And, of the, and that's you know, four, four and a half billion people. In that four and a half billion, you have two and a half billion that are at the base of the pyramid that uh, for all intents and purposes are operating outside of the normal financial uh, ecosystems that, that you and I participate in. And so when we think broadly about innovation and the advent of new and emerging technologies, uh, most of the world has a cell phone, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting the, the emerging innovation from the rest of the world's entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and large corporations, it doesn't filter down to them because they are poor. Is that quite Dale's next question there. Great um, uh, desk furniture going on in that Lots show. Of planes. Lots of planes. What's all that about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think the session was mostly about blockchain, Colin, <laughs> and less about the planes. But that's a good question. So what did you take away from that show, Joe? Um, well, what I like about um, stories like that uh, and, and um, these kind of exploratory sessions uh, like that one uh, is that a lot of the um, headlines around the latest technology revolve around something that's happening in Silicon Valley or some app that millions of people have downloaded in China, mm -hmm. which and some of these the shifts that are happening or emanating from um, some of the real kind of technological hubs are hugely important, obviously. Um, but it's great to see how, well, firstly, how, how does technology, how could technology impact the people who could actually benefit, benefit from it even more? I think he uses the comparison of um, like people, the, one of the fastest growing um, app technologies is people ordering fast food. Mm -hmm. um, which, if you think about it, I mean, I use it, as you can probably tell, but um, it is it's a kind of a luxury, whereas there are people who are not be able to kind of fully participate in the economy who could really benefit from, th from things like blockchain mm -hmm. and many of the other um, technologies that are being developed around the world. And that's, that's what I found so fascinating, was that, you know, these, he was explaining how the, the poorest people in the world don't have an identity. They don't actually exist. They don't even have proof that they own their farm, even though it's been in their family for years. And blockchain gives that, that uncorruptible trace of this is this person's, and it allows those people to participate mm. in the system. And I hadn't truly, personally, understood how much those people actually aren't in the system. And when they become part of the system, the potential for not only you know, connecting in through, uh, through apps and things that will really matter to them, but actually connecting in because they can, because they actually can through the data. It was, I found it absolutely fascinating. And the potential there was huge. Mm. That's one for my watch list in that case. Definitely. Could you tell us about one other thing, Ellen, you've watched? I think I found the, the plastics one very interesting. I, I know mm. we, we kicked the session off talking about plastics and the new plastics economy, but some of the comments there were really interesting. We had, um, in fact, I've written a note here. We had Michael Shaver um, and Mike Vernon. Mike Vernon was from Google. And there were just two comments that, when I was listening, just kind of rang out. One was that Michael Shaver was talking about the designing of systems for performance of materials as one thing, but also for what it's used for afterwards, which is obviously you know looking at the big bigger picture. Mm. And it just seemed to be explained in a, in a very pragmatic way in that session. And then the, Mike Werner from, from Google was talking about, you know, when the private sector bands together to address systemic change, great things can happen. And for me, that resonated absolutely with the new plastics economy, with, with what we're trying to achieve. There's some fantastic quotes. He was a, he's a very optimistic chap, Mike Werner. Yeah. yeah. He was so he was a very stand-up comedian? 
No, that was that was Michael Shaver. Get oh. your Michaels right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Miss, the missing Michael. Michael. Yeah, we we were mistake. going to play a clip from that show, but I think we're we're not quite going to make it in this one because we've got something else we want to move on to in just a second. And just while the chaps are setting up our special feature, <laughs> Joe, <laughs> what uh, what one show called System Reset would you recommend people watch? Um, well, there's this documentary. <laughs> Do you really want me to talk about no, System no. Reset? Give, give us one show. That you um, well, I, I would encourage people, I know it was mentioned um, briefly before, I'd encourage people to watch all the sessions from Startup Day. I really liked that as, a, as something completely new at, at this year's DIFF. Um, that, uh, that we had 12 startups pit, kind of pitching throughout the day, um, some really high caliber, we mentioned Nairobi, but there are many more um, high caliber startups. And it, I, we, we always surface at the diff some really amazing ideas from startups of all stages, people who have received funding, people who just have a, a great idea or have cooked something up in their garage. But with the addition of the Circular Economy 100, um, as a as a kind of destination for some of those startups is it, that was a, a a nice way to have something to build on. Um, so picking a, the best startup to go into that platform. It'd be great to follow that in the next diff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then you can have a cohort and, of, yeah. um, of of startups that came via via the diff. Definitely, definitely. Look, I went to all the effort of making a Jenga game. Colin, are you um, gonna? <laughs> I think. <laughs> could you both uh, have a wee shotty at my game? After you, Joe. I'm gonna go. It'd really that. cheer me up. Did you say a wee shotty? A wee shotty. It's Scottish. That's Scottish. That's absolutely. <laughs> oh, nonsense. you've come for a purple. I have. Uh, is there something? It's so almost like I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Should I know something about um, purple? Ooh. Are you a technophobe or a technophile? <laughs> You're gonna be a file, aren't you? No, I, oh, well, I guess somewhere in between, but more on, I'm increasingly on the phobe side of things. Oh. Um, so uh, I was talking to one of the diff team about smart speakers recently, mm. someone in this room, and I'm a bit nervous about those. That they can like be Bluetooth? listening all the time. No, like, oh, like yeah, yes. AI assistant. <laughs> yes. I'm a bit tinfoil hat about that. Um, <laughs> they might be listening to all the juicy conversations that be. I never have. Um, <laughs> but uh, sorry, I think, but it's a serious point. Um, with all these technological new capabilities, there are there are privacy concerns, and I think it's that something we've picked up certainly on, at the diff over the past few years. I don't don't remember it seeing it on the agenda this time around, um, but but it's it does relate to a lot of what we talk about. There's so much technological progress. Mm -hmm. Who's keeping check on what kind of should be brought into to become reality, and mm -hmm. what should maybe have a few more controls around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and innovating to what end? It seems we can do anything. You know, we can have smart speakers, we can 3D print body parts, but kind of to what end? And I think that's where the mm. circular economy is so exciting yes. for me because if you put that circular lens on it, you're actually building a system that runs in the long term. I'd agree. Ellen, please take one of my bricks. Oh, did, did you know which one was going to... What are the rules with Jenga, incidentally, around where you're allowed to take from? Do you want me to put you this can back? Take, I think well, you can take do you want me to put this back? I just, I can I'm going to let you no, take because no, it's three might, down. Three no. down is good for me. When I play with my kids. Should I, should I go lower? I thought you were. I'd fine. rather you were. He's very straight. Okay. He's quite stiff. Well, <laughs> at least I haven't knocked it over. Right. What's your favourite building in London? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know these questions? These questions would have been great for the CEO of the London Waste and Recycling Board, <laughs> who we had on at the launch. That's funny, isn't it? That's so strange. Can I answer? Yes, you yeah. can. Okay, I'm going to. Say, <laughs> I'm going to say the London Eye. Because it is Ooh. it is circular, oh, nice. oh. and when you go up, <laughs> <laughs> and when you go up in it, you see the world in a different way. It's beautiful, just like the circular yeah. economy. Do you, are you a little bit frightened when you go up that London Eye? No, nothing frightens you, right? No. No. Yeah, I, I do have to hold on a little bit. I feel a little bit worried. <laughs> you, you, but you don't I, like escalators either, do you? <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate that's you sharing true. that with that's us. True. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have only got time left for a little featurette, uh, which we're going to throw in just now. I don't know what it's called, um, but here it comes. Seven. Oh. Forty-two. Daniel. Doesn't matter 18. if you missed it. Try and guess the diff statistic. Seventy-three. One. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, you seem to have. Uh, your slide deck's incomplete here. I must have skipped that slide. That's poor. Yeah, that's, that's poor. You've, uh, you haven't really made it to the end of the diff. 
Well, let's call it the Diff Stats game. Ellen, when you first came on, you rattled off a whole bunch of stats, and you're very good at um, remembering statistics. Mm -hmm. But I think you're going to struggle right now as we <gasps> throw you some statistics from the Diff this year. So, the first question, 80% <laughs> of things oh. in our home are what? Uh, Joe, you can oh. think of these as well. I was thinking remanufactured, but that's absolutely not. Are uh, uh, single-use items? I'm going to go with clothes. Oh, mm, I don't uh, think that. Made out of plastic. Made out of plastic and clothes. But that's quite a long answer, isn't it? Maybe... Um... <laughs> but if, if, if you're close, I'm going to give you a okay. point. All right. Okay. The answer is... Oh. Oh, you oh. were right the first time. Yeah, Did you used less that? than once. Oh, no, 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 you said single use, I'm, right? I'm running with it. Okay. <laughs> right. I'll give you half a point for that one. So that was in this session, Innovation, Investment and Unicorns. That was on the startup day, of course, right? So, what about this one? 50% of people in Myanmar eat what? Insects. Oh, very confident answer. I was going to say insects. I... Do I have to say something different now? Yeah. Um, uh, meat. <laughs> <laughs> Insects. insects, insects it is. Are insects meat? Were you about to say oh, that? I was going to say, are they? <laughs> you can get some you're pretty not, meaty you're not, ones. Yeah. You're not getting a point from meat. Mm. Right, the average American is already on something work a week. What's that going to be? Uh, um, I think it's 21 hours, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, very specific of you. 35? It's just a sort of finger in the air type yeah, I, thing. I think that's a number, but I've no idea what number. I'll go with Joe. Mm. I'll, I'll, I well, don't... You can't take his answer. <laughs> uh, Six days. Six days work a week, mm. and the answer. Oh! oh! Oh yeah, I remember. Um, this <laughs> this was from the, my conversation with Azim Azar. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, oh. and he he basically says that um, that some Americans are working a lot, some not so much. So uh, the work isn't actually distributed. So if it was, if we distributed work amongst the entire population we could all work a bit less, which I thought was quite a nice idea. Yeah. With some sort of security net, I guess, mm. like, say, universal basic income, right? Yes. Yeah. Although he doesn't, he's not convinced by that. People he's should watch not. that uh, to he find out more. He talks about that in, the, in that He does, yeah. yeah, he does. Super, okay, next one. The world has 60-something left. Oh, this that sounds can't a bit years depressing. of oil. Uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go with years of oil. Years of oil. Hang on, I just said that. No, you said it can't <laughs> be that. So I'm, I'm taking it. Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speechless. Um, I didn't think you had that in you. <laughs> oh. Someone's giving you a. Uh, what are you say? A sixty. Uh, Bagpipe oh. players. <laughs> no one's taking it up anymore. Really? Yeah. That's terrible. a real problem. Oh, it's a crisis. <laughs> Did someone talk about it at the day? No. Oh. No one cares. <laughs> well, I can't think of anything else to be 60 left. 60. You're um, just passing, Ellen. Something years left. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't think of it. Yeah, I'm going to pass. Yeah. You'll like this one. I'm going to say harvest. Do you know the answer? <gasps> yeah. Harvest it was. Will the world really run out of food? Unless we, unless we radically change the way in which we farm um, and, and, and in particular how we look after our soil mm. was the argument put forward wow. here that we are running out of topsoil at an alarming rate I think mm. a, a centimetre of topsoil takes about a thousand years mm. to mm. Um, to generate yeah, it costs 40 billion a year to the global economy as well topsoil degradation it's huge well that was when we did our report about five years ago yeah that was a while back yeah mm. yeah mm. okay uh, do we have another question yes we do mm. Mm. Four and a half thousand something. A million tons? Oh. Four thousand million tons, would that be right? Oh. oh. Eiffel Towers. Oh. Didn't even give me a chance. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. gonna say some landmarks. I knew you were going to steal mine. Uh, Big Ben's. <laughs> <laughs> There's no point putting it back on. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And finally... No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, that's the last one. Yeah. Okay, how Can't would you, you know? know your own game? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got an advantage. <laughs> okay, uh, final words on the Disruptive Innovation Festival 2018. Joe, what's your final message to people watching at home? Uh, don't uh, switch off now. We know people haven't 
watched all of the diff, uh, diff films and live studio sessions. Um, so keep watching throughout the, uh, the catch up phase um, and, and continue the, the discussion as well. There's um, been some amazing discussion that's built up over the course of the past three weeks, both on the website and on, um, on, on Twitter. And it really feels like this year the diffs kind of come of age with amazing engagement around the world, top quality sessions, great speakers. Um, so we encourage people to, to continue that momentum. And Ellen, from you, what's your parting words here? I think that there's just, you know, personally I feel there's so much content, you know, I haven't had the chance to see the majority of it. And yet the sessions I have seen have been absolutely phenomenal. So a little bit like Joe, you know, use the catch-up sessions and, and dig into the, the material and also send us feedback. As Joe said, you know, yeah. we really feel that the diffs come of age and, you know, the numbers are going up and the, 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 the quality of the content is phenomenal. But send us feedback. You know, if there's something that you think is missing from the diff or something we could do better, just let us know. We'd, we'd really appreciate that for, for the next one. We, we absolutely love the feedback. It's people telling us they like something or how, mm. how something might be improved or what we can do differently next year. Mm. I think it works really well for us as a team, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, to get that. Especially when it comes to trousers. Yes. <laughs> Plenty of feedback on those tonight. Feedback on this. <laughs> when, who can tell me from the audience when does the catch up period end this year? 20th of Jan. January 20th. So all the content will be available online until the 20th of January on the thinkdiff.co website. As I say, something in the region of 145 sessions that you can watch from there. But just before we say goodbye, we just want to say a few thanks to various people who've been involved in helping put all of this together. For example, first up, the production crew from this live studio. It's the Skinny Mammoths, everyone. <laughs> Not only do they put up with working uh, alongside us every day here in the live studio, but also they're the production crew behind two of our great films that we produced this year. Um, they do super work, they're great fun to work with, and thank you very much from all of us. Um, our global partners as well absolutely deserve a thank you for making all of this possible. It's the, the global partners of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, the audience out there, of course, as Ellen had just said, we love your feedback. We love the fact that you're watching our shows and that you're sharing your questions with us. They're really, really useful. And we watch uh, also the output on Twitter as well. That's valuable to us too. I mentioned Ken Webster earlier. He was the brains behind the original idea of the diff. Uh, so a big shout out to Ken if you're watching. I think you're in Uruguay right now, Ken. So um, hello from us. And also the entire, uh, the entire diff team in here. A big thank you um, to everyone who's involved in putting this together because some people uh, never sit in front of the camera, but the work they do is invaluable to making all of this happen. And I have to say finally too, to the rest of the staff team at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who've been really supportive of us as a diff team in putting this together and dropping in to the diff when necessary as well. We really appreciate all of your work. But that's the final words then from the 2018 Disruptive Innovation Festival. Thank you very much for watching. Watch on Catch Up and we'll see you in 2019. Cheerio. Woo